Today, we are in the San Isabel National Forest and headed up to the highest peak in the Centennial State. another episode of Rooftops of America. Today, we're heading up to the highest point in Colorado. Located southwest of the city of Leadville, in Lake County, Mount Elbert is the king of the Sawatch, a sub-range of the Rocky Mountains stretching 80 miles long from the southeast to the northwest. They are also part of the Great Continental Divide that stretches from Alaska down to the Strait of Magellan in South America. There were three major episodes of mountain building that helped form the rugged landscape of the American West. These were intense bouts of tectonic activity. The last, the Laramie orogeny, occurred 65 to 70 million years ago and was responsible for raising the Rocky Mountains. The mountains were formed by an oceanic plate slipping under the continental plate. The Rocky Mountains are unusual for the fact that they occur several hundred miles further inland than what is typical for this type of tectonic activity. This mountain building event would also give the region its rich mineral resources. This particular section of the Rockies is known as the Sawatch Range, and it was created by a geological event during the orogeny known as the Sawatch Uprising. In a sense, these are young mountains wasn't even the first range that was here. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, there was another known as the Ancestral Rockies that had been slowly eroding away over time. At their greatest height, the Rocky Mountains would have been over 20,000 feet tall and similar in appearance to the Himalayas. Over the past 60 million years though, erosion and glacial activity has worn them down to their current form. To put this in a bit of perspective, even eroded down into its current conditions today, Colorado still has 53 peaks of 14,000 feet in height and at least 300 feet in prominence, more than any other state. All that height means that Colorado is the state with the highest mean elevation in the country. On a side note, Colorado is also home to the highest state low point as well. It is located on the border where the Orickery River flows into Kansas. At 3,315 feet, the lowest point in the state is higher than 23 other state and territory high points. Mount Albert is the highest point in the Mississippi River drainage, and it's also a key contributor to it. The Arkansas River's headwaters are here, fed from the melted snowpack of the mountains. At 1,469 miles, it's the sixth longest river in the U.S. and the second longest tributary in the Mississippi-Missouri River system. Humans have been living in Colorado for at least 14,000 years, before the arrival of the Spanish and later Americans. This was the territory of the Ute, a large nation of Native American people that stretched from Colorado to Nevada. The Utes were hunters and gatherers, moving from location to location via a well-established set of routes. In fact, you can still follow one today in Rocky Mountain National Park and the appropriately named Ute Trail. Their whole way of life would change, though, when they made contact with the Spanish. The horses the conquistadors brought became valued commodities, and the Utes made good use of them, becoming expert big-game hunters and bolstering their reputations as fierce warriors. American interest in this area started with the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s. That nearly doubled the size of the country, taking the border from east of the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. But this was not without a little bit of debate. Spain still had claims to this area as well through the Viceroyalty of New Spain. When Zebulon Pike was sent out to explore this section of the Purchase, 
he would cross into Spanish territory. His party would be taken prisoner, sent to Mexico for questioning, and finally released near current day Louisiana. His book on his experiences would become an international bestseller. The set boundary between the two nations would firmly be established in 1819 with the adams one Treaty. But that only lasts for a short time. By 1848, with the conclusion of the Mexican-American War, the borders of the U.S. would move from here all the way to the Pacific Ocean. In 1858, the Pikes Peak Gold Rush would bring about the establishment of the Colorado Territory. Like Black Mountain, the high point of Kentucky, it would be mining that would put this area on the map, though instead of coal, it was precious metals that created the boom town here. The first big rush in this area was here at California Gulch in 1860. The discovery of placer gold, the kind you find in rivers and streams, brought a horde of miners and prospectors to the region. Now getting to the gold wasn't as easy as you'd think. Efforts were continually hindered by a heavy, dark sand. There was another problem as well. This was still Ute land, and they were not too keen on having all these new neighbors. They requested the U.S. Army to remove the trespassing miners, but that never happened. In fact, quite the opposite. New agreements and treaties were hastily written up, and the Ute were forced to cede even more territory, and eventually forced to leave the state. One of the key players in these negotiations was Samuel Hitt Elbert, the territorial governor of Colorado. The miners, grateful for his efforts, would name the nearby mountain after him. It just so happened that that heavy dark sand that had hampered the placer miners was a rich lead-based mineral called sericite that coincidentally also had a high concentration of silver in it. But once the prospectors figured that out, they'd track it back to its source and discovered several major silver loads and set off in 1876 what's become known as the Colorado Silver Boom. Leadville would be founded in 1877 and had a population of 300 people. The following year, it had exploded to 15,000. By the time the boom was in full swing, it would be the second most populous city in the state. At 10,152 feet, it was, and still is, the highest incorporated city in the United States. All the people and money flowing through Leadville made it a wild and lawless place filled with swindlers, hustlers, and thieves. Effective law and order was in short supply, and it was a dangerous job as well. The first marshal was beaten and driven out of town only two days after getting the badge. The second lasted a month before he was gunned down by his own deputy. The third man selected for the job was Mark Duggan, an Irishman who had come west to make his fortune, though he had no luck prospecting. By the time he arrived in Leadville, he already had a reputation as a tough-as-nails fighter who had killed a man in a gunfight. Duggan is one of the forgotten gunfighters of the Wild West, a man with a fearsome reputation and a willingness to take the law into his own hands if it got the results he needed. His exploits read like a dime store western paperback. He stopped a lynch mob not once, but twice, a hundred men strong, with only himself, his two pistols, and a threat to shoot the next man who stepped forward. He kicked out the local magistrate for being too lenient with his sentences and refused to let him back in until he apologized. He was not afraid of anyone and he once arrested one of the richest men in town for being drunk and disorderly. Duggan was so good at his job that when his term was up and he moved away, the town brought him back because nobody else could do the job. Mark Duggan's strong arm tactics would earn him quite a few enemies over the years and eventually it caught up to him. A decade later, as Duggan was leaving the Texas Hotel, he was gunned down. In an interesting twist, Duggan knew who actually had shot him, but he refused to say, bolstering, even to his death, his tough guy image. In 
In its heyday, Leadville would also see other famous and infamous characters stroll down its streets. Poker Alice Ivers, author Oscar Wilde, the unsinkable Molly Brown, and gunfighters such as Doc Holliday and Luke Short. It's safe to say all the wealth pouring out of the mountains helped establish Colorado, bringing civilization and statehood. Denver and Leadville practically became urban and modern cities overnight. Though, in the long run, only Denver would truly thrive. Leadville's fortunes would take a serious hit with the Panic of 1893 when the price of silver plummeted. Fortunes were wiped out. Miners had to shift to different metals, in this case, lead and zinc, which, while not as profitable, were in the long run much more stable. Over 130 years, the Leadville mines would produce 99 tons of gold, 8,200 tons of silver, 1 million tons of lead, 785,000 tons of zinc, and 53,000 tons of copper. They would also produce significant amounts of manganese and molybdenum. The last Leadville mine closed in 1999, and today only the nearby Climax mine remains reopened in 2008. Even though the mines brought prosperity to the region, there was a steep price to pay. Waste and contamination from mining operations severely impacted the environment and the health of the community. In 1983, the California Gulch was listed as a Superfund site. In the years since cleanup has begun, the environment has slowly recovered and Leadville it's recreated itself as a tourist and outdoor enthusiast haven. These days, you can find all types of outdoor adventure, skiing, mountain biking, fishing, and hiking, to name but a few. And if all that isn't enough of a challenge for you, well, guess what? Leadville has you covered. It's also home to the Leadville Trail 100, one of the toughest ultra marathons in the country. Now, let's turn our attention to Mount Elbert. Mount Elbert is overshadowed by many of its lower kin. It isn't the most technical, picturesque, challenging, or even the most dangerous peak in the state. It just has its height. So in a bit of irony, it's been easy to overlook. It's not the most popular or famous peak in the state either. That most likely would go to Pikes Peak. The view from the summit inspired America the Beautiful and has more visitors than any other mountain in the state. That popularity has led to the assumption that the state high point is there as well. And while Pikes Peak is the tallest mountain in the front range, it still falls 300 feet short of Mount Elbert and is only the 30th highest 14er in the state. When it comes to challenges for the title of highest point in Colorado, there is one story that sticks out more than others. Mount Elbert's initial measurements were not always the most accurate. Originally, it was surveyed at 14,433 feet, only a dozen feet taller than the second highest mountain in the state, nearby Mount Massive, which, at one point, had been considered the state high point. There was a group of people who thought the state high point should be massive, despite the evidence. In their minds, a much more impressive mountain, and thereby more deserving of the title. Mount Massive is indeed impressive, and quite fitting of its name. A massive block of rock with five sub-peaks, and more area over 14,000 feet than anywhere else in the lower 48 states. It also has a much more challenging climb than Elbert, an almost eight mile scramble up 4,500 vertical feet. The plan to win back the title for Massive was straightforward. They'd haul stones up to the summit and build it up. While this borders on the absurd, it was taken quite seriously for a number of years. but. Mount Albert had supporters as well, and they didn't take this challenge lightly. So they climbed up Mount Massive too. And when they'd get to the top, 
they'd knock down any rock piles or cairns they found. Eventually, it was realized that this was a chaotic endeavor. And since that time, Mount Albert has had no challenges as State High Point of Colorado. As a coda to the event, in 2002 when they remeasured, Albert gained seven feet. It's highly likely that Mount Albert has been climbed previously, but the first documented ascent was in 1874 by Henry Stuckel, a member of the Hayden Survey, one of the four great surveys of the American West. Since that time, it's been climbed in all sorts of ways. Orator and lecturer Anna Elizabeth Dickinson went to the top on a government mule. It's been summited by ATVs, and in 1949, they drove a jeep to the top to see if it was suitable for a ski resort. Mount Albert has been called the Gentle Giant, but it should not be approached lightly. While there are several routes up the mountain, for most hikers, there are two choices. Either the north or the south, Albert Trails. So we'll be taking the South Albert Trail to the summit. As always with summer ascents, make sure to start early. By the afternoon, lightning and thunderstorms can blow up and create an incredibly dangerous situation. In the summer, with a four-wheel drive vehicle, you can shave off over three and a half miles of the climb by driving up Forest Service Road 125B. So, from this point right here, it's a five-mile hike to the summit. Recently, a new trail has been put into place that has increased the length. Let's go check it out. start on the Colorado Trail, but nearly half a mile in, you will reach a junction. Take a left onto the South Albert Trail. The South Trail is currently part of a multi-year improvement effort spearheaded by the Colorado 14ers Initiative. reach treeline near 11,900 feet. From this point to the summit, you will be exposed to the elements as you cross the alpine tundra terrain. Having the proper gear is important for this hike. Check the weather conditions before you go, but keep in mind, the weather can change rapidly. Wear layers, bring a wind and rain jacket, and have good footwear. You may also wish to bring a day pack with sunscreen, a hat, plenty of water, snacks to keep your energy up, a first aid kit, a compass, and multi-tool. Trekking poles may also be useful.
the Elbert hike has a reputation of dragging on and on. If you opt for the North Trail, you will go over several false summits. The South Trail is more of a continual grind up. Remember, one, two, three. Remember to stay hydrated as you go and monitor your heart rate and breathing. This will help minimize altitude sickness. If symptoms persist or worsen, head back down to lower elevation. As you ascend, you may come across alpine wildflowers and wildlife, like these chatty pika, that make these upper reaches their home. Depending on the time of year, you could have the peak all to yourself or encounter quite a party when you reach the top.
Once you get to the summit of Mount Elbert, take a bit of time to appreciate the reward of your efforts. The views at the top are absolutely breathtaking. And here we are on the rooftop of Colorado, the summit of Mount Albert. Coming in at 14,440 feet makes this the third highest state high point in the USA. I'm Sky Mar Thaler. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Rooftops of America. I'll see you soon.